வணக்கம்
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to everyone who is joining us by telephone or the 70 or so folks joining us through Zoom this morning and others still coming through the door and those of you who are joining us through Facebook, especially if you are connecting for the first time, welcome. I am Cheryl Perry and leading worship along with me this morning is Bob Wallace, who's gonna give a little wave, Francis Chason, our Minister of Music, and Jessica Crawford, our accompanist. <laughs> and also this morning, Burl Aitani, who is reading scripture and has written and will read the prayers of the people. And helping out with all things technical, things like running videos and spotlighting people who are speaking and recording the service and handling breakout rooms are Lorraine Halatic and John Whitehead. Mike Chason, give a little wave guys, Sophia Chason, and Tanya Pritchard. Thanks all of you for making this happen. <laughs> I noted in my calendar this week that includes a number of significant dates that there is Remembrance Day, of course, on Wednesday, and the birthdays of theologian Martin Luther and activist Dorothy Day. But as a child of the 1970s, I also took notice that November 10th is the anniversary of the day in which Sesame Street first aired in 1969 <laughs> on PBS. <laughs> in those days, every week, the average American preschooler watched 27 hours of television, much of it violent and created for adults. And so Joan Gantz Cooney, a documentary producer for PBS, envisioned a free, fun, educational television show for children, especially for disadvantaged children, to help them prepare for kindergarten. Sesame Street with its motley crew of Muppets, uh, created by young visionary puppeteer uh, Jim Henson, was an immediate hit. So. To mark the occasion, we have a special guest who has joined us for worship this morning. <laughs> Kermit, we are so glad you've joined us for worship this morning, and we are glad that all of you have joined us from wherever you are connecting from. And uh, we hope uh, that we, you continue to enjoy this service of worship to keep the fun going and tell us about a fun and fundraising event that's being kicked off in the coming weeks, Burl <laughs> Itani is going to unmute herself and talk to us. There we go. All right. Good morning, everybody. You saw good the morning. announcement um, about the um, uh, soup and sandwich Christmas basket bash uh, on um, uh, in first word this morning. But I want to remind you that we do have some baskets. We have a Christmas basket. We have a baking basket. We have a wine and chocolate basket um, and maybe two or three more. But uh, we need you to register. And so every single one of you on the screen this morning, we want you to be registered for um, our, our Saturday, December the 5th from 12 until two, there is going to be a very special draw and you must be registered. So give First United Church a call or uh, call any one of the fundraisers, the fundraising committee that you see on um, in the first word. But I want to give you a little teaser so that you will want to get involved. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. that's all I'm going to tell you. That is uh, a clue as to why you want to register and be part of the fun of fundraising at First United Church with our soup and sandwich. And no, Sarah, you don't put the soup and sandwich in the basket. Um, soup and sandwich Christmas basket bash on December 5th from 12 to 2. Hope you'll join us. Burl, Kermit and I are so excited about that. <laughs> Thank you for the team of you that are organizing yet another fun way for our community to gather online at this time. Friends, we, when we gather for worship, we begin with the acknowledgement of lands. When our ancestors came to this land, there were already people present. So before we came, this was their ancient and ancestral land as it is today. Gathering here in the central Okanagan, we acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Sayoks people, the Okanagan and West Bank First Nations. We acknowledge their stewardship of this land, 
and we ask that we might build equitable and lasting relationships with these peoples who have welcomed us to their land. We also acknowledge today, as always, that First United Church seeks to be a safe place for persons regardless of their race, age, gender, ethnicity, or orientation. All are welcome, online or in person. When we gather, we also, wherever we are, in our homes or in a church building, whether we are in person or whether we are one person or many, we gather as the family of God and as followers of Jesus, healer and light of the nations. And if the matches would work, I don't understand this. Oh, there it is. We light the Christ candle. Let us join our hearts as we hear the words to our call to worship. If we will but listen. God will speak to us in parables. God will tell us stories lived out by our grandparents. If we will but remember. We will discover all we have heard and known, all the wonders God has in store for us. If we will but share. We can tell our children and grandchildren, even those not yet born, the glorious stories of our God. Please join me in singing Voices United 625. I feel of God. Hello friends, I hope you and your families are well. Last Sunday, we celebrated a special day in the church year, All Saints Day. We lit a candle to remember each person who had died in our church community in the last year. 
This week, the Sunday closest to November 11th, we are also remembering people who have died. Instead of a candle, another symbol is associated with Remembrance Day. Do you know what it is? A poppy is a symbol of remembrance associated with people, those alive and those who've died, who fought in wars. And others are doctors and nurses. Some are even special ministers called chaplains, whose job it is to comfort and bring hope and encouragement to the men and women who are a long way from home, facing danger, and some who are injured or dying. One such person, a young medical officer named John McRae, wrote a very famous poem called In Flanders Field. You may have heard it read at a Remembrance Day assembly. In the poem, John McRae talks about the rows and rows of small white crosses, each one marking the place where a person who has died in battle was buried. And in between the crosses, some red flowers, poppies, had sprung up. It was John's job to care for hundreds of wounded soldiers every day, some he had come to know well. He might look down and see the face of a man he had just had breakfast with that morning. It is said that John wrote the poem in Flanders Field one day when a close friend of his, Lieutenant Alexis Helmer, was killed. McRae wrote the poem in the hours after. In Flanders Field, the poppies blow, between the crosses, row on row that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. The poem became known all over the world and is still read today on Remembrance Day at ceremonies at the Cenotaph or in assemblies. Because of it, the red poppy has become a symbol recognized everywhere, worn to honor those who have sacrificed so much for our freedom, but also as a symbol of the hope for peace. November 11th, or Remembrance Day, which is this Wednesday, was originally called Armistice Day. It is celebrated on November 11th because on the 11th day of the 11th month, a truce was declared that ended World War I. The word armistice is from the Latin word arma, meaning arms, and sister, which means stand still. Arms are another name for weapons, like guns and bombs. Imagine the stillness, the quiet that came when both sides in the war laid down their weapons. In just a few moments, we're going to hear Tim Watson play a famous piece of trumpet music called The Last Post and it will signal the beginning of a time of quiet and stillness, a time of remembering those who've died in war. May God's peace be with you on this Remembrance Sunday. And until next time, friends, take care of yourselves and each other, and remember how much you are loved by God.
Thank you, Tim. In a moment, the children and I and Suki are going to leave for the breakout room for Sunday school. We have tried to identify families as they arrive, thanks to those of you who put an asterisk before your name to help Mike identify you. But if you've received an invitation in error, or if your children don't wish to come out to Sunday school, or if you would like an invitation and haven't received one, would you just use the chat feature to message him, Mike, that is, privately, and he will make sure that you get invited to Sunday school. Off we go. And as they go and pass it, learn to hear and know the love of Christ, and then to pass it on, we continue together. God's loving embrace is for everyone, no matter how old or how young. For God knows that we all try. And no matter how many times we mess up, God forgives us quickly and mercifully. I invite you to join in the prayer for forgiveness led by Burl Itani. It is never easy to admit how foolish we are approaching God. You have chosen us for yourself, and we continue to shelter false gods in our hearts. You promise to be with us in every moment, but we can find little time for you. You send your word to us, but we are too busy listening to the noise of our culture to pay attention. Have mercy, eternal one, and forgive us. Speak to us so we might listen and in hearing be transformed into your people. Fill us with holiness so we might give ourselves wholly to others. Enable us to serve you faithfully and completely, even as did our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is our assurance. God forgives us. This is our hope. God's love is everlasting. This is our truth. God is with us always. We will speak the truth. We will live the hope. We will share God's mercy. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Amos. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate 
I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. And now from the Gospel of Matthew. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, look, here comes the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealer and buy some more for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Hear what the Spirit is saying through these ancient words of Scripture. Thanks be to God. Well, my friends, we're in our eighth month. And if I were talking about being pregnant, you'd know <laughs> that it would soon be coming to an end and the anxiety and excitement would be tempered with the desire for those last days to arrive so it could be over. Some of you are smiling as if you remember those moments. But instead, I'm talking about pandemic. And the passing of eight months does not seem to bring an end in view. In fact, it was just this last week that Dr. Bonnie Henry here in BC put out a new health order banning all gatherings for Fraser Health Region and Vancouver Coastal Health Region effective immediately. No in-person gatherings. Once again, it seems there is no end in sight. Those ancient ancestors of ours in the Psalms and other places had the right cry. How long, O Lord, how long? We humans don't seem to be very good at waiting. The young women in the Matthew text waited quite a while, but it wasn't eight months, it was just hours. Our neighbors to the south had to wait days for the results of their election, and it may not finally be over, but it was just days. Some people wait for surgery to ease their pain. And months, not hours, can be the length of their wait. And there are some who are confined to beds in care facilities where their every need means pushing a buzzer or ringing a bell and waiting for an overworked aide to come and help them do what they once did for themselves. In one way or another, waiting is part of the reality of being alive, an ongoing face of living. Waiting also seems, us, seems to take us to dark places. Waiting seems to express what is almost unutterable, our lack of control, our fear of the unknown, our worry about whether or not we're ready, our anxiety about being prepared. Waiting brings many emotions. There's anticipation, wonder, eagerness, dread, agitation, fear, longing, loss. Of course, much of our emotional response is determined by that for which we wait. 
our time of waiting will be experienced differently depending upon what we expect. But always waiting is hard. One of my struggles with waiting is not so much about the feelings experienced, but the fact that as I wait, I cannot seem to be content with the present. And then, then today, as Burl read, Matthew breaks into thinking about how much we don't like waiting with the wonderful news, keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. <laughs> well and good. But the day and hour for what? Scripture suggests that that day and hour for which we wait is like the coming of the bridegroom, the return of Jesus, the breaking in of the realm of a heavenly-like life, the ending and a new start. But for most of us in this 21st century, the language of waiting for Christ's return is not part of our everyday church talk, if it ever features in our church talk. And this is where this makes the sermon hard for me. It's a new preaching territory for me. Because I'm coming to realize that the language of a second coming is, in part, our human attempt to put into words the faith that we all hold, that all evidence to the contrary, God, God is somehow in charge, and that at some point, God will break into our lives and things will be transformed. A faith that there is beyond ourselves, a power, an energy, a life that can indeed transform things. But even those words are an oversimplification of that faith, yet they point to what becomes a deep down confidence in us that God will show up, that as the prayer says, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that what counts on my part is how I live while I'm waiting. And that means I need to be ready to respond when called upon by life and its circumstances, to respond when culture or society collide with God's will being done. Once a long time ago, I had a dream. I decided it was time to get in better physical shape. So looking ahead on the calendar, I saw that there was a half marathon set for a few months away. And I entered it, setting my goal as the time to train and get ready for the race so that I would be in better shape. As usual though, the time I promised myself to prepare got swallowed up with all those myriad of other things that happened, the work, the family, everything that happened. You know that stuff. I did get the outfit, proper gear, including new shoes, water bottles. I was getting ready, sort of. And then in this dream, suddenly the day of the marathon arrived and there I was dressed in my finery, sporting my water bottles, wearing my new shoes. And I realized I'd not once taken the time to train my body to get into shape that I would need to run this half marathon. And then in that moment when the starting shouts rang out, I woke up grateful that it was only a dream. But my heart was racing and my body was trembling. It was only a dream, yet it seemed so real. In that dream, I had set a grand plan an admirable plan to set myself a goal to work to attain it and to become a better me. But I let other things and activities, all of which were good things, get in the way of that preparation until it was too late. That awareness of how my intentions don't always carry through into action is one of the struggles with today's scripture. Many of us treat our faith life like an imaginary marathoner, 
Our faith is what we intend more than what we practice. Oh, we know the words. We practice the forms of believing. We may even attend church, perhaps regularly. But we do so without any attempt to embody the beliefs, to not just talk the talk, but walk the walk of faithful living. We settle into our childlike anticipation of Christmas and Easter, the good news of God's love, but we never wrestle with issues that help us grow up into mature believers, like how do we prepare to wait? Centuries ago, the prophet Amos pointed out to his people that their pious practices and tuneful worship, full of the smells and bells that produce feelings of awe and holiness, all of it was an abomination in the sight of God if it does not grow out of their lives being lived according to God's demands for justice and righteousness. In effect, Amos states, God is disgusted with your worship if it ignores the impoverished. If greed, idleness, a false sense of security, and a reliance on appeasing God with offerings are the forces that hold us back from caring for our neighbors and doing good works. Only a constant search for justice and righteousness will enable us properly to discern God's will to remain in relationship with others, and to live out good works. That cry for justice from Amos and is lying behind Matthew's statements about being prepared, staying awake, and being ready to find God at work in our world, even as we wait for that second coming, that moment when all will finally be transformed and become heavenly. Amos calls Israel to enact justice as the expected result of genuine worship, to in fact be worship. Now the concepts of righteousness and justice go together. In Hebrew, the term justice refers to fairness, attention to the needs of the poor, an end to oppression, a legal system that protects the rights of all people. Righteousness connotes healthy relationships, a sense of commonality, a recognition of God as the one who has formed the people into a community, a respect for the bonds among the people, and indeed a respect for all peoples. The image of justice rolling down like waters calls for justice to happen immediately, like a sudden deluge or perhaps, Sarah, a sudden snowstorm. The poor and marginalized should not have to wait for justice. Justice must happen now, with the urgency of a coming storm. The image of ever-flowing streams calls for a steady supply of justice and righteousness. The community should sustain justice. Justice should remain available like a stream provides a reliable source of water. Matthew invites us to wait, to wait with confidence that behind all the turmoil, all the uncertainty, in spite of everything that we see around us, God will show up. So in the words of Matthew, yes, keep alert. But rather than being that keeping alert for what might come some time, we're also to keep alert for the many ways in which God enters into our present attempts. We're to bring exactly what we need, and God brings that. So even in the time of waiting, we're not in the absence of God. We're recognizing our dependence on the presence of God. But really, how does one wait for those events that mark the day's passing, or those events that fill the day with reason and purpose? Those events that you need desperately to remind you that you're still alive and still matter. 
How does one wait for that event that shows the very coming of Christ? And on the other side of that, on another level, how do you fill these times of waiting when we know of the inevitable reoccurrence of racial oppression or of another news report of gun violence, of further hashtag me too incidents, of yet one more demonstration or speech that deems LGBTQIA2 people as less than being whole? How do we wait in the presence of actual bigotry, of predictable xenophobia, of practiced sexism? These intermediate moments are preparation for the coming of God. Because the return of Christ means that there will be a moment that will arrive when how we respond depends on our readiness to give witness to the presence of the holy in our midst. These moments of response, they determine our readiness to acknowledge our trust in God's presence. So the questions that come to us today, are our lamps burning, ready to call out the injustices we see? Are our lamps trimmed so as to give witness to the righteousness of God present here and now? Are our lamps filled with oil so as to be ready for the long haul of resistance and persistence? Are we building resilience and persistence into our faithful waiting? Are we preparing for the unexpected to occur? My friends, when Christ comes and calls to us, Christ will call at our continued complacency towards that which undermines the bringing about of the reign of God, and we'd better be ready to respond. We'd better be ready to answer for our compliance to empire at the expense of those whom God deems as blessed. We'd better be ready to answer for our collusion with hierarchies that perpetuate patriarchy and privilege. We'd better be ready to answer for our collaboration with structures and systems that have no interest in and no intention of changing, even though that is what God seems to be demanding. Waiting is an active state of being, a time when we prepare ourselves and practice living out our beliefs that God's will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. A time to remember that what I do while I'm waiting, both my preparation and my actions, what I do while I am waiting matters. It matters a lot. It even brings in a sense of peace to that waiting. So here's a chance for us to hear of that peace, to think of that moment when God's grace and our lives connect. Grant to us peace. May it be so as we listen to Sophia and her, hip, her harp played on a novice path.
mission is to engage in God's ministry to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to wipe the tears from every eye. Your generosity has empowered this community of faith to work towards fulfilling that goal. Thank you for what you've done and blessings on what you will yet undertake in the name of Christ. Amen. now grateful for all the gifts that our Alleluia Ringers and Nikki Atwell shared with us and all the other gifts that make this community so extraordinary. Let us join in prayer. As we pray together, we can stand at the edge and watch while you seek to bring hope, healing, peace, and joy to everyone in the world. Or we can take that step of committing our lives as well as our gifts in working with you in this ministry of grace. Bless our gifts, bless our lives, bless our service, we pray. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Creator God, we come to you this morning in preparation for Remembrance Day. This year will be a particularly strange day of remembering. 
we cannot gather as a community to remember those on all sides who have given their lives for our freedom. Those freedoms, O oh God, we cherish more today than ever before. We give thanks that we live in this country. We live in this place where we wait peacefully and calmly for our election results. We would ask you, O oh God, to please keep safe all those who serve on our behalf around the world. We remember and give thanks for those in leadership in our own country, in our province, in our city. Guide them with your spirit. Give them peace so they can continue to lead in kindness. Keep them calm as they strive to keep us safe. At this time, calming God, we acknowledge and pray for the new administration in our neighbors to the south. In the words of the president-elect, may you, <coughs> excuse me, may you raise them up on eagle's wings, make them shine like the sun and hold them in the palm of your hand. Let us also remember, Lord, those leaders of our five United Churches here in the Central Okanagan, West Bank, First United, St. Paul's, and Winfield. Guide them and us as we explore our common future together. Healer God, we ask you to give us all strength in the coming days to follow the guidelines of our health officials as we continue to battle this virus and guide those who are working diligently to find a vaccine. Keep safe all of our first responders who work on our behalf. In our Pacific Mountain region, we pray today in the prayer cycle for Kimberly United Church, their congregation and minister. We pray for the Pacific Mountain Region Council and their executive. In the World Council of Churches, we pray today for Aotearoa, New Zealand and Australia. We remember always God, those in our community who do not have the same resources that some of us take for granted. They do not have a warm bed, enough warm clothes and warm food. Help us to remember them and all those in our community who are trying to comfort them. We remember our sister congregation in El Triunfo, El Salvador. And now we remember those in our congregation who are requesting our prayers. The family of Ken Guilford, brother of Jean McKenzie. The family of Lorraine Haladic, who live in London and are all suffering from COVID. We remember Lorraine McClarty, Kendra Berg, Pearl King, Pamela Broadhurst, Faith Campbell, Polly Campbell, Margaret Scott, beloved Susan Seal, Barbara Sparrow. And in silence, we remember others in our faith community with love and care. And let us now, O oh God, join our hearts and our voices as we sing the prayer that Jesus taught us.
And as we come closer to the end of our worship, Cheryl, we welcome you and the people who were out with you in Sunday School back amongst us. And maybe you have some words to share of what you did there. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. We talked about peace as a feeling that comes over us and also about the absence of war, two things we've been thinking about today on Remembrance Day and how we can be peaceful people and bringers of peace, peacemakers in the world, just like Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children of God. Wonderfully done. Thank you. And I'm, we're so glad that you're back so that you can join us in this last hymn. I invite you to join me in singing hymn uh, 684 in Voices United, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. Now I invite you to lift your hands and reach out to the screens on either side of you that the blessing that we are about to encounter might be shared one with another. Go forth, knowing you are a beloved part of God's creation. And go, knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship we find in the community of the Holy Spirit is with you and will sustain you now and forever. And together we say, Amen. <laughs>